Leviticus chapter number 27, verse number 30. Let's all read that together. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. That sounds like a very familiar text to, to this church family, doesn't it? All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. For just a few moments as we talk about worship, as we talk about worship, for just a few moments I'd like to speak from this topic, this theme, or this subject, God's requirement for the tithe. Y'all got quiet on me, but that's okay. God's requirement concerning the tithe. As we know, January is stewardship month. And we spend our time during the month teaching and preaching on stewardship. And of course, today is no exception, being the second Sunday in January of 2024. So again, as I always love it when you help me share the word of the Lord, if you would please turn to your neighbor to your left or to your right and say, neighbor, neighbor. the pastor's going to share today God's requirement concerning the tithe. Look at somebody on the other side, and again, if you feel like talking to yourself, that's, that's all right, because you can talk to yourself. If you would, please, look at somebody left to the right and say, neighbor, the pastor's going to share today God's requirement concerning the tithe. That word, tithe. My brothers and my sisters, there are indeed many people in Christendom that have a problem when it comes to stewardship. January is always a quiet month for me because everybody hold on to their amens. But that's all right, I'm going to preach it anyhow. The problem stems from the fact that they have not been provided accurate information with respects to what financial stewardship is all about. Mm -hmm. Or they have seen some things done, done in the past that has convinced them that they should not or will not tithe or give biblically. See, some people have been hurt when it comes to giving. And now they think that they're hurting the church because they're not giving. When the reality is they're hurting themselves. Because I, as I get into it, we're going to look at the fact that we're not giving to the church. Our giving is to the Lord. It's very interesting to me how quickly people begin to make negative statements about the preacher or the pastor when they start sharing and proclaiming what God requires of his people in the area of financial stewardship. Some of those statements are, you probably heard them before, there he goes again, asking for money. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. They say things like, every time I turn around, he's bringing up money. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they even say things like, why does he have to talk about money all the time? I'm going to say it. Help us, Holy Ghost. But let me be clear. Let me be clear that part of the preacher slash pastor's responsibility to God is to preach and teach the whole counsel of God to God's people. You see, the preacher pastor does not have the right nor the authority to preach only what people want to hear. The preacher pastor has to preach what people don't want to hear. And more importantly, what people need to hear. I need y'all to help me right there. Look at somebody and tell them, neighbor, I need to hear God's word. 
One of the things a lot of people don't want to hear is that God has a requirement for all believers. And the requirement that I'm talking about today is tithing. Tithing is that word. So let me share with you a true story I read some time ago. The story goes, two men decided one day to start a business. And before they started, they agreed that they would give God 10% of their earnings. During the first year, they made some money, and they gave 10% to God. First year, some money. Remember that. As the second year closed, they realized they made more money. Remember that. More money. And they gave a tithe to God. When they completed the third year, they gave the tithe, but thought that the tithe was so large that it was not feasible for them to continue to tithe. Mm -hmm. So, I'm still, I'm still quoting the story here. During the fourth year, they did not tithe. And they saw, uh, they did not tithe, and their earnings declined. They did not tithe, and their earnings declined. The same thing happened in the fifth year, and they saw an even larger decline in their earnings. They realized that they had broken their promise to God and were disobedient regarding the tithe. So they decided to go before God, repent. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I, I didn't do what I promised to do. I'm glad God doesn't have to tell us I'm sorry that he didn't do what he promised to do. Hey, I wish I had a witness right there. So they decided to go before God, repent, and ask for forgiveness, and began to tithe again. When they started tithing again, God began blessing their business again, and they learned how important it is to be obedient to God. True story. True story. This story is truly applicable to so many people in Christendom as they can't seem to figure out why they are struggling financially. Amen. Notice I said in Christendom, I'm talking about believers. They're trying to figure out why they're struggling financially. And they do not seem to realize that it's all tied to their disobedience to God in the area of financial stewardship. You see, God wants us to understand is that the tithe belongs to him. And we do not have the right to redirect his tithe to other areas. We don't have that authority. During the pandemic, it was told to me about a church member that made the statement that they would continue to tithe again when the church reopened the doors. When the song said, open your mouth and say something, say amen or say ouch. Hmm. They said they will continue when the church reopens or the church regathers. As a result of the pandemic, many churches across the country were closed permanently. Some of them are still struggling financially. Why? Because members stopped tithing. Help us, Lord. Let me help some people here if I can. A pandemic does not give us the right to decide when we will or will not give to God. Amen. Another aspect of this is staying home from worship. Staying home from worship does not give us the right to withhold God's tithe. The truth of the matter is some people are still in a pandemic mindset.
still in a pandemic mindset because they have not returned to the house of God and want to rely on technology Sunday after Sunday because of the convenience of it all. It's a shame. Y'all still with me? It's a shame that people think that since they are not in the church building, they don't have to tithe to God. Let's be real today. The tithe does not belong to the local church. Did y'all catch that? It does not belong to the local church. It belongs to God. You see, God designated the local church as the place where he will receive his tithes. And what the church does with it after it has been received is between the church and God. You see, a statement is made, well, I'm not going to give because I don't know what the church is going to do with it. The, the, the problem with that is you, you've got all of it wrong. It's not a matter of what the church is going to do with it. It's a matter of you being obedient to God when he puts it in your hands. Let me ask a few questions here. What if God decided to turn off the air we breathe? Because we don't attend worship on a regular basis. Y'all do know that God has the power, sovereignty, authority to do what he wants to do. If he can make it rain on a fleece and dry all around, he can do something with the air in somebody's house. What if God decided he was not going to allow the sun to shine because we don't attend worship on a regular basis? Have mercy, Jesus. What if God decided not to let you remain healthy because you don't attend worship on a regular basis? A pandemic, my brothers and sisters, does not determine if and when we should tithe to God. A natural disaster does not determine if and when we should tithe to God. If we are working and have a source of income, we have the responsibility to tithe to God. And I found that due to a financial mismanagement, window shopping, that turns into overspending. Mm, Y'all get quiet on the pastor. And investment opportunities that go bust. We feel we don't have enough to tithe because of our other financial responsibilities. The truth of the matter is, if we don't tithe to God, we hinder our ability to pay our other debts and our priorities have been misplaced. So if we ever want to see the blessings of God, we have to meet God's requirement concerning the tithe. The book of Leviticus is a book that gives the believers a handbook for day-to-day -day living and behavior. Written by the hand of Moses, this book teaches about drawing closer to God, talks about holy living, and how God wants to be obeyed and worshipped. Our selected text today deals with the tithe. And one thing I've learned about tithing is that people who do it willingly, people who do it willingly, don't have a problem with it when worship shifts to giving. You see, just as we can open our mouths and say something during praise and worship, when the choir is singing, we should open our mouths and say something 
when it's time to worship the Lord during stewardship. It's been my experience that the people who don't tithe are the ones who seem to have a problem with it. Ooh, y'all got real quiet on me there. Obedience to God in the area of tithing is no different than being obedient to God in other areas, like in the Ten Commandments. So what's in the Ten Commandments? He talks about idolatry, using God's name in vain, remembering the Sabbath day, honoring father and mother, killing, adultery, stealing, lying, and coveting. I just ran right through the Ten Commandments. Obeying God in tithing is just as important as those other areas in the Ten Commandments because tithing is not a recommendation. Tithing is not a suggestion. And tithing should not be done only when it's convenient. Mm-hmm. So for a few minutes, let's take a closer look at the tithe and learn about God's requirements concerning the tithe. So let me start out by asking the question. Point number one, what is the tithe? What is the tithe? Look at somebody ask the question. What is the tithe? What is the tithe? The word tithe in this verse comes from the Hebrew word, and that Hebrew word is ma'aser. And it means the tenth part. The pulpit commentary says here, and I quote, tithing, like the cherim, are introduced as things well known. Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, Genesis 14 and 20, and again in Hebrews 7 and 4. Jacob vowed to the tenth to the Lord in Genesis 28, 22. Whence we see that the practice of the payment of tithes was not a mosaic institution, but immemorial, unquote. If nothing else, brothers and sisters, the backstory regarding the tithe with Abraham and Jacob helps us to understand that the tithe was practiced before the law. Before the law thus showing us that the tithe actually exceeds the law. Lord have mercy. Again, the pulpit commentary calls it a, a immemorial, and that means from very old or from the distant past. So when people tell you, and trust me, it's out there, when people tell you that tithing is no longer required because it was given under the law, you tell them that it was practiced before the law, and it's just as relevant today as it was in Bible days. Now, there are some people who teach gener generosity giving. Generosity giving is above the tithe. People have a problem with the tithe, so they're going to have a real problem with generosity giving. Amen. The tithe is really the starting point. We have to start at the tithe and go from there. Now, let me help us here real quickly. I didn't plan to say this, but God just laid it on my heart. Every time you get a raise, God gets a raise. Because you have to go back in and recalculate what the tithe is. Lord, help us today. The verse goes on to say, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, talking about giving the tithe, it stipulates then what people were to tithe in those days. And knowing that almost all people worked in the agricultural in industry back in those days, they were told by God what it was that they were to tithe on. And this was a direct reference to their increase. If you think about it, when they planted the seeds, all they had was seeds. But when it came to harvest time, they had an abundance of what was actually planted. That was their increase. Y'all still with me? Our increase today is not seeds. 
It's not fruit, but currency. Some would call it the almighty dollar. Now remember, money's not bad. It's the love of money. That's the root of all evil. So concerning increase, let's, let's talk a little bit about our individual increase and see if we are being obedient to God with the tithe. And knowing that it is a tenth part, that means a dime on every dollar based upon our gross income. Gross income is before taxes, before they take out Social Security, expenses if you are self-employed. Whatever money you make, that's what you give as part of the tithe. Think about this, if you will. You just won $2 billion in the lottery. And you realize that the tithe is, I believe, $200 million. Is my math correct? $200 million. And there are some people who would probably go, I don't know about that. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Check this out. To give <laughs> to the church. Not realizing that you're giving to the Lord. I use that as an example, but some people would probably say, well, why are Christians even playing the lotto? We laughing, but guess what? There are Christians who are playing the lotto. Amen. They went in $200 and $500, and guess what? Their tithe don't increase. Uh-huh. I'm going to try my best to get through this today. So concerning the tithe, concerning the tithe, let's see, let's see. A couple of examples. If your gross pay was $10,000 annually, your tithe would be $1,000. Most people are like, mm, that ain't too bad. That ain't too bad. If you earn or your gross income was $100,000 annually, your tithe would be $10,000. Oh, well, okay. If you earn $200,000 annually, your tithe would be $20,000. Pastor, can we have a meeting? <laughs> yeah, I know I'm telling the truth. If your gross income or your tithe, if you earn $500,000 annually, your tithe would be $50,000. $50,000. When you look at these numbers, there are a lot of people that will say, I'm not giving that much money to the church because I don't know what they're going to do with it. If I can help somebody here, please, if that's the case, please change your attitude and your thinking to reflect again that you're not giving to the church. You're giving to God. And I'm a witness, brothers and sisters, that he will bless your obedience. You see, churches are struggling today because too many people want to tip God. But in doing so, they want a tithe blessing. They want to tip God, but they want to tithe blessing. Churches can't do ministry, meet payroll, have resources available to do ministry and meet the needs of deserving people because people are holding on to or redirecting God's tithe. We get mad when the church can't or won't fund a program, yet we haven't done our part to finance God's ministry by giving the tithe to God through the local church. You know, I've been around a long time, been pastoring 21 plus years, preaching 
over 30 years, 31 years. I've been around a lot of churches. I've seen a lot of things. And I would tell you that there are churches in our society that can't do things because they don't have the financial resources to enable them to do those things. It's because people are holding on to God's tithe. Or maybe people haven't been taught about God's tithe. I'm here to tell you right now, I'm standing flat-footed, talking about God's tithe and our financial stewardship because I have a responsibility from God to help us understand God's requirement concerning the tithe. We have to do our part. We have to be obedient to God. Check this out. When you're obedient to God and you bring it to God's house, God will bless your house. So we've got to meet God's requirement concerning the tithe. Number two, as I hurry to a close, number two, the tithe belongs to God. Look at somebody and tell them the tithe belongs to God. For some people, this is a new revelation. What? Belong to God? Where's that at in the Bible? Now, mind you, they don't read the Bible. But they want to ask the question, where is that at in the Bible? We just read it in Leviticus 27.30. We just read it. So it's a revelation as they have always assumed that the tithe belongs to the church or even to the pastor. Again, the church is where God receives his tithe. And any church that truly wants to worship God in spirit and in truth will handle God's tithe in a manner that is pleasing to God. I'm going to go on record again and let everybody know, here in the sanctuary, those who are watching on live stream, I am too scared of God to mess around with God's resources. So I want to make it clear, I'm not doing anything underhanded because I can't, and trust me, I won't. Amen. Amen. I want that to be very clear. So don't think that when you bring the tithe that it's coming to the pastor. No, it's not coming to the pastor. Amen. It's coming to God. I need us to understand that. If we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth, we got to bring it here so that God can do what God is going to do with his tithes and his resources. You see, the tithe belongs to God because everything belongs to God. Dr. Adam Clark says here, and I quote, this God claims as his own. And it is spoken of here as being, part, being a point perfectly settled and concerning which there was neither doubt nor difficulty. Because in, in Leviticus 27 and 30 said the tithe belongs to God. That's clear. No doubt, no uncertainty. God could claim the tithe as his own. Why? Because everything else belongs to him as well. I'm glad y'all with me this morning. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says he created everything. It says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 14 teaches us, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also with all that therein is. I think that's clear. The heaven belongs to him. The earth belongs to him. And everything in between. Everything on the earth belongs to him. Let me just throw out something personal here. You know, when you have kids, sometimes they feel like they can do what they want to do. And so when they don't like the fact that things are not going the way they want to, some of them try to threaten their parents. 
and say things like, I'm going to call CPS on you. Yeah, I'm telling the truth. There are some kids who have done that. My kids are very clear. They understood. If they call CPS on me, they walking out the door naked. Why? Because the very clothes that they were wearing, I paid for them, which meant that they belonged to me. So if we understand the tithe belongs to God and the money belongs to God, that means that everything we wear belongs to God. Everything we drive belongs to God. Everything in the house belongs to God. We belong to God. The takeaway here, my brothers and sisters, is that once we know that the tithe belongs to God, we don't have the right nor the authority to do anything with it except give it to God. Amen. Amen. For example, for example, too many people have taken God's tithes on vacation. Amen. They get on the cruise ship, got a fat wad in their pocket, and it's there because they didn't give God his tithe. I wish I could. He said, say it ain't so, I wish I could. Too many people, too many people have taken God's tithe to the casino. And we got several around here, not too far, that some people I'm sure have done that. And they walk out of there mad, busted, and disgusted. I remember some years ago watching a show called Sanford and Son. Yeah. My man RJ remember that one. One episode, Fred decided to go to Las Vegas. And he went to Las Vegas and he got on the tables and he started uh, playing the games and everything and lost all the money. So then he realized he didn't have any money to get back home. He went outside to one of those wishing wells. Y'all know those fountains where you put the money in there and say, God bless me with this and bless me with that. He found himself in the wishing well in the fountain picking up all the change so he can have money to get home. You see, when you mismanage God's money, when you mismanage God's tithe, God has a way of making us aware of what it is we've done. Too many people, my brothers and sisters, have taken God's tithe and they applied it to major purchases that they wanted. Too many people have taken God's tithe, given it to Santa Claus and retail stores during the holidays. Retail stores like, whoa, boy, our bottom line has gotten big this year when January rolls around. Too many people have taken God's tithe and they've given it to nonprofit or charitable organizations because they think that was a good idea. I know a lady some years ago shared with me that she was having a problem at the church she was attending. She came to me one day and she was talking about things and she said, well, you know, Pastor, she called me Reverend, actually, because she knew me as Reverend, although I was pastoring at the time. She said, Reverend, because I'm having some problems, I, I tithe, but I tithe to different organizations. Nonprofits, you know, like Father Joe's and things like that. I, I, I give to them because I, I want God's tithe to be beneficial to people. So I said, sis, I need to take off my reverend hat and put on my pastor hat. Because I need to help you understand something. When the scripture says the tithe belongs to God, you don't have the right to take it to a nonprofit organization, a charitable organization, because you're having problems at the church you attend. 
your responsibility is to God. And God will take care of the rest when you become obedient to him. You see, we don't have the right to give it somewhere else. Our right and responsibility is to give it to God through the local church. Amen. And if she was having such problems at the church she was attending, then it becomes a matter of prayer. Well, God, where can I go or where do you want me to go? Amen. Because anytime we decide we need to change uh, our local church, guess what? We need to ask God for permission. Because the truth of the matter is, he has assigned all of us to the local church for his glory. You see, that goes back to the fact that all of us have a work. All of us have a ministry. All of us have a niche that we're required to do in God's church. That's why we can't be sideline saints. We can't sit around and watch everybody else do the work. So she gave, and it was really a bad idea for her to give to those nonprofit organizations. And you see, if we do not give God his tithe, giving it to anything or anyone else is a bad idea. Dr. Tony Evans says here, and I quote, he says, when we approach giving with the mindset that everything belongs to God, we realize what a blessing it is that he allows us to give these resources back to him to be used for his glorious purposes, unquote. A privilege for us to give back to God. Again, we've got to meet the, God's requirement concerning the tithe. As I wrap it up, number three, the tithe is holy. The tithe is holy. I need some help here. Look at somebody and say, the tithe is holy. I find it very interesting that the words tithe and holy are found in the same sentence. They actually interact with one another. Since it would indicate that they both have their beginnings in God, God took it upon himself to call the tithe holy. And that tells us that we should handle the tithe as the holy entity or object that it is. The word holy here comes from the Hebrew word kodesh, the Hebrew word kodesh. And it means sacred place or thing, a consecrated thing, dedicated thing, a hallowed thing, even to the point of holiness, holiness. Since God calls the tithe holy, that's what it is. It's holy. It's holy. It's holy. When I do that, I'm talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what I mean by that. If I could clarify this just a little bit, I remember I was born in Baton Rouge and at the age of 10, we moved to New Orleans. So in growing up in New Orleans at that time, and I'm talking about 1975, 1976, a whole lot different than it is today. But back in that day, in that time, I remember that people had a lot of respect, not just for God, but also for God's property. I recall, you said it, sis. I recall walking with some friends of mine. And we found ourselves walking past the church. And we realized that we needed to walk across the street. Because we didn't want to say or do anything that would disrespect God's church or God's property. You see, back in those days, there was a lot of respect because 
They felt like, they thought, they knew that the church really represented, if you will, God's presence. So the last thing you wanted to do was to do something that was contrary to God and God's presence. Why? Because they re recognized that place was holy. Can it help us understand something? Where we're sitting at right now is holy. I say that because the presence of God is here. And because he's here, that makes it holy. I'm so glad when we come in, we don't have to take off our shoes like God told Moses to do. He told Moses, take off your shoes for the place that you're walking is holy. Where we are right now is a holy place. I need us to understand just how holy things are. The Bible teaches us in 2 Samuel that King David was moving the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And there was a point in the movement where the oxen shook the Ark and it looked like it was about to fall over. The Ark was so, uh, such a sacred thing that only designated people were allowed to handle it. Somebody said too many hands in the pot. It spoils the soup. So everybody want to put in their own secret ingredient. I need some Cajun seasoning. I need some season oil. I need some paprika. I need some onions. I need some salt. I need some pepper. You put all of that stuff in it, and it's like, what happened to the soup? She said, it ain't soup no more. It's just a mess. The ark was sacred. The ark was holy. And only certain people were designated to handle the ark. The Bible says a man by the name of Uzzah, he saw that it was beginning to lean over and he reached out to help put it back in place. We're told in 2 Samuel chapter 6, Verses 6 and 7, it says, And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Verse 7 says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, for there he died by the ark of God. Unquote. You see, we got to be very careful how we handle God's things. Lord, have mercy. Unfortunately, generally speaking, some people don't have the same level of respect for God in his, and his things as people did back in the day. There doesn't seem to be the same level of respect and reverence for God today. And that includes handling God's tithe. Lord Jesus. Some people, nobody here I'm sure, but some people, when they come around to worship God financially, they'll take the money and ball it up, put it in a small wad. Mm-hmm. Sometimes put their hand in the basket. So nobody can see what and how much they're giving. Y'all know I am telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And they do so like they're doing God a favor. Trust me when I tell you this, God knows your heart, and he knows your wallet, too. Open your mouth and say something. Say something, say something, hallelujah. <laughs> 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 
Some people come around and they just throw the money in the basket. And they think they're doing God a favor. They're giving with the wrong attitude. They're giving with the wrong mindset. The Bible teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 7, it says, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. Why? A cheerful giver. When it says, every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. He should understand that the tithe belongs to God. And as a result of that, guess what? He should purpose in his heart to give God his tithe. Amen. And we don't have to celebrate when we come around like we want people to know how much we give him. Wouldn't it be interesting in the church when you come around and there was a microphone in front? And when you come around and say, hey, I'm Brother Perkins. I'm giving $5 today. <laughs> hey, I'm Sister Perkins. I'm giving $10 today. <laughs> See, y'all, y'all think that's, that, that makes you giggle. I, I've been in a church that actually put everybody's individual giving on the wall. Not with their church membership number, but with their name. And for some, it was an incentive to do better. Let me help us understand something. The incentive to do better is found in the word of God. Because God's word is what teaches us to do or to handle God's tithe. Y'all still with me this morning? If we were operating that way, if you will, we really need a change of heart grudgingly or of necessity. We need a change of heart. We need a change of attitude when it comes to worshiping God financially. So we get to that place and we're doing that, so we need to pray and ask God to forgive us and then we begin worshiping God the way he desires and the way he deserves. Again, it's our responsibility to meet God's requirement concerning the tithe. So as I hurry to a close, again, tithing is a requirement that we should not take lightly. But understand it's something that God requires of all believers. Did y'all catch that? All believers. Let me ask a question. Do we have any believers in the house? So we've got believers in the house. We recognize that our responsibility is to do what God requires concerning his tithe. So do we understand that to the point of knowing that I personally, individually have a responsibility to God and is not going to reflect my relationship with the church because even the church belongs to God. Amen. As we give biblically, guess what? The church is able to do more things in ministry. Amen. The preacher's outline in Sermon Bible says here, and I quote, it says, The believer is to tithe. Give at least a tenth of his income to the Lord. I'm going to tell you it again. Open your mouth and say something. That that song is in my soul right now. So So if we can be obedient in the areas of the Ten Commandments, we can also be obedient in the area of tithing as well. Some people find it difficult to do so. That's because they're not really operating in faith. Let me help us understand something here. To tithe means to operate in faith. Because in doing so, you're being obedient to God, and now you're watching God do what he said he's going to do. When you roll over to Malachi chapter 3, he says, prove me now. That's the only place in Scripture where God said, prove me. And there he was referring to the tithe. Prove me now herewith. 
So we've got to operate in faith so that we can see God's rich blessings as a result of our obedience. And again, Jesus shows us that even though his journey was not easy, it was worth it for him to obey Almighty God. Because you see, he took the hard beatings while going from judgment hall to judgment hall. It was because of his obedience. He took the hard trip going all the way up to Golgotha, meaning going up to Calvary. Why? He was operating in obedience. He recognized that his mission was not to leave heaven, come here, and just hang out for a little while. It was to leave heaven, come here, and to be the salvation necessary for mankind. I wish I had it. Say something. Say something. He took the pain while having the nails driven into his hands and his nails driven into his feet. I'm talking about him operating in obedience. He, he took the pain when they pierced him in his side. He, he took the pain when they placed a crown of thorns on his head. And while he was hanging on that cross, the Bible says Jesus died. But because of obedience to Almighty God and what was declared in the word of God, the Bible says Jesus rose from the dead with all power in his hands, all because Jesus met God's requirement. I need us to understand something today. God is ready to bless us. The question is, are we ready to operate in obedience? Some people are saying, well, pastor, I can't afford to tithe. The reason why you can't afford to tithe is because you're not tithing. I wish I had a witness today. You see, we've got to recognize that the 10% comes off the top. That's why we stand here every Sunday. We place it in our right hand. Because we want to give God what's right and not what's left over. It's easy to pay everybody else and then give God a tip so that you can make it throughout the week. The truth of the matter is, if you operate in faith and give it to God off the top, he'll give you more money than month. I'm not talking about something I heard about. I'm telling you what I know. Because when my wife and I decided to operate in faith back in 1989 and begin to tithe to God, God hasn't skipped a beat. And I'm so thankful that because God is so awesome, the silver is his. The gold is his. The cattle on the hill is his. Even the hills belong to him. When the United States is in a recession, God is never in a recession. And when we operate in faith, we can watch God do what only God can do. He said, prove me now. And when we operate in faith and see what God does, we know that it's nobody but God that can bless us the way we are blessed. Let me ask a question. I said earlier, do we have any believers in here? I saw a lot of hands go up. Hallelujah. My question now is, are you blessed? Are you blessed? Are you operating in faith? Are you handling things God's way? It's easy to be happy in God when we're doing what God told us to do. I can't speak for nobody else, hallelujah, but I am a believer. And I'm happy, so happy to know that God is God and God has all power in his hands. And when we meet the requirement of God, the Bible says he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing that we won't have room enough to receive. The choir says something about flow to you. Isn't that what the choir said? Flow to you. God is so awesome 
we don't have to flow in him. We can just enjoy the overflow. When he pours out the blessing that we don't have room enough to receive it. It's almost like saying, you know, I want a cup of coffee. And I want to put it in a cup. And I want to put it on a saucer under the cup. And when you pour the coffee in the cup, I want you to keep pouring. Not until it gets to the top. But I want it to flow onto the saucer. Because whatever is on the saucer is the overflow. That means more than what was asked for. Y'all don't hear me today. And God is so awesome, he can bless us again like nobody else can bless us. Open your mouth. Say something. Amen. 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 Amen.